code that doesn't sound like it's from a long time ago. Like the, the Y album, yeah. So, I mean, how, how the hell did you come up with that record when you were, what, 16, 17 years old? Well, we started when we were, me, Mark and Bruce started the pop group when we were 17. You know, I was inspired by the, obviously the onset of the Sex Pistols originally, mm -hmm. but also the, very much for us, the New York stuff. We'd seen like everybody, you know, the enemy and belt were like our little Bibles. Mm. So we would uh, religiously look for anything that might have a connection with Iggy Pop or the New York Dolls. And suddenly these things started sprouting up like the Ramones. Can, can uh, we actually trace it back to, to Bowie? Like Bowie the Educator, well, Bowie showing us more to pop music. Well, I, I saw Bowie when I was about 13. At Bristol Colston Hall, and Mark would oh, Mark Mark jealous every day, every time I mention it. <laughs> when he, so I bring it up when he's, I feeling, saw when trapeze. he's feeling good. I saw trapeze and Niels Logfren, and Niels Logfren was on a trampoline, and Gareth won't go on a trampoline. But my brother well, came home one morning, yeah. and at the breakfast table, one of his eyebrows was... No, both his eyebrows were missing. Yeah. And I kind of looked at him, and my dad went mental because he wanted to go to art school or something. He said, My dad said, What do you want? He said, I want to be an artist. He said, We well, can paint the bloody bedroom, bathroom rather. <laughs> but he shaved his eyebrows off to look like Bowie. So your brother went to the gig? His brother so was, was in the girls. same queue as me, waiting to, to buy tickets. <laughs> but but, but he, his brother was in the sixth form and should have, you know, sent me. Gareth's you know, a lot more put developed than me. <laughs> So, so where he's shagging at like eleven. His brother, his brother, brother had a beard. beard his brother had a beard. His brother had a beard. My mate had three <laughs> kids when he was twelve. And he climbed up under the suspension bridge, mind. So, <laughs> weird, <laughs> so where were you? Where were you that night? How come you didn't Crying go? Crying at home. What do you mean? How come I didn't go? He he went. Your brother went, and you were home with your eyebrows. I travelled all this way to try to be showed up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I just want to go, Gigi Allen. I want the toilet. <laughs> I'm just interested now. No, I was yeah. in. I was in. I was into. Um, I don't really like music, to tell the truth. Yeah. I've only got into it for the clothes. I remember seeing Alvin Stardust on the on the telly going, "Coo, coo, I just want you with a leather glove." Great song. Da, 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 yeah, thing yeah. that you do. Da, 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 I just want a coo, coo, coo. I set, knew huh? Freddie Starr, yeah. <laughs> and I thought that's a job. Yeah. Pointing with a leather glove and a ring, spent them working down Safeways, whatever it was, Quick Save, whatever it was called back in the day, Tesco yeah. Tuckers. But the clothes were important for you. You used to go up to London, didn't you? Well, yeah. John. <coughs> yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> but you, you're up in London and so. You Where are you from? Uh, Blackpool. Well, I didn't yeah. go there, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're in Bristol, it's a lot easier. Yeah. No, well, our you, first manager, going back to this why. Yeah. We have to get. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> um, our first manager again. He was an Eamon Corner. He was a sax player in Eamon Corner. Eamon, Eamon, Eamon Corner. Mm -hmm. Paradise is half as nice with Andy Fairweather Low. Yeah, yeah. Have you worked with him? No, but it's a great song. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I prefer the Attack. Um, and he had clothes shops called Clobber. Oh, I've met that guy. Yeah, Alan Jones. Alan, he was yeah, a sax player, yeah, yeah in Wales. Wow. And, yeah. yeah, in Cardiff. He sold a club. He there. formed Guns N' Roses in the end. LA Guns became Guns N' Roses. He went to um, Sunset and Vine and all, opened, they were all into cowboy boots. Yeah. For fuck's sake. <laughs> what a checkered existence he had. He should be here getting interviewed. Well. <laughs> yeah. so, so we used yeah. to go and hang around the clothes shop. Yeah. And obviously we were going up to London. I remember I remember persuading my mum and dad, pretending I wanted to go to some museum when I was about twelve or thirteen, and get them to wait outside, and I ran into the basement of the Hope and Anchor and saw Kilburn and the High Roads. Mm -hmm. But there was a place called Acme Attractions on the King's Road that we used to go and get our pegs from Gareth ended up marrying the girl who was sat on the scoot with Don Letts. Jeanette Lee. Bowie Pegs. Yeah, yeah. We don't, it's not, we're not here to talk we're not sex therapists. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that was that was your main shop you went to in London, was it Acme? Well, I'd yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, you, I went up and saw the Ramones in '76. Oh, here we go yeah. again. <laughs> 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 where, where, where were you that night, Mark? He was at the he was at the Skies Club. <laughs> Not so, competitive. So what, what, what was the Ramones like in 1976? Uh, <laughs> the really good thing was Mark wasn't there. <laughs> I was, 
and then you can see anything. <laughs> and you can hear the whole gig as well, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Oh, it was, I'd say there was 17 people there that looked like punks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, and a couple of them were Sid Vicious and Viv Albertine, mm. who gave me a poster for the Sex oh, Pistols yeah. at the 100 Clubs. <laughs> yeah. And I, of course, did the obligatory 16 year old and told him to fuck off yeah, with yeah. their poster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, the Stranglers just looked like a bunch of hippies. Yeah. And then, obviously, the Ramones came on, and Dee Dee did the one, two, three, four, and it was fucking heaven, man. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And, I mean, uh, three, four months later, that whole formula was dead to me. But yeah. for those four months, yeah. that was just absolutely magical. Just the, you know, the, the energy, energy you know, the energy. Yeah. Was just, but that's the crucial you know. thing, John, because our mates up the road, Jer Valentine and Nick Shepard, had already yeah. formed the Cortinas, mm -hmm. And we were travelling with them all the time up to London and going to the Roxy with them and support gigs. And I was going to Wales to see the pith. I didn't go to that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 2-1. <Two, one. laughs> I've got a few up my sleeve. <laughs> <clears throat> and the thub we thanked. But Excuse you, you, me. And who got little Johnny Dool first? But you, you and more, who turned down Patty Smith? Oof. You were more into clubs, weren't you? At that time, because you, were, mate. Because, you were quite, clubs. because you were quite tall, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let me just finish this bit. No, we'll go back to that. I'm just interested. Yeah, let me just finish this bit because oh. punk was already <laughs> going on, and me, Bruce, and Gareth, Simon was my club mate from downtown. Yeah. Downtown, and um, but that was like high wasters and 14 pockets on your bags. Anyway, uh, suede ed stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, You've just gone back because we were already yeah. travelling with the Cortinas going about yeah. and me and Bruce yeah. and Gareth were part of the posse um, there's a film of us in the Roxy isn't it in the toilets well none of the toilets which in October anyway um, do you want to carry on that story on that. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we will chat Not and say tell them about you in June October thought, why should we form a band yeah right and with one of the records this coming out yesterday, this year we're going to give away a, a why not plectrum saying don't listen to this form your own band yeah stolen from Mike Watts um we just thought, again, like Gareth was said, punk was already kind of dead to a certain extent. The, the excitement of it had kind of happened, which for me was the clothes and the attitude, the politics of it, more than the fucking three-chord pub rock. Yeah, yeah. I threw a crazy cabin on the Camp Bishops, so that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not going to start slagging off other bands. <laughs> you Rob, uh, John, you sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Be all day. <laughs> I don't really like white music. And anyway, so, so we just thought, this is already happening. We'd look like twats. We'd look like UK, not, nothing wrong with the UK subs, but we would look like second generation punk. Yeah, that yeah. We started playing now. So we point. just thought, why yeah. don't we mix in, in our own very naive way, we'd only just, apart from Gareth, who's obviously a, a maestro, <laughs> a, a savant. Because he could play the piano. He's already... He play all sorts of yeah. things. He can play the one-eye flute. <laughs> Again. <laughs> this is why I usually do interviews on my own, because I'm out <laughs> gunned. Uh, we thought, why don't we mix in some of the <laughs> why don't we why don't we mix in some of the stuff we're into, like dub mm. and funk and like mental free jazz and, and weird electronic stuff we were just finding in junk shops. Because we thought that was as much the attitude of the cut and paste sort of juxtaposition of mm. putting a pin through the Queen's nose like Jamie did, you know. Of course, yeah. So that's why we started experimenting. And I've never thought back onto it, but just thinking back recently, we're going through this old artwork, we were going up to Manchester more often than we were in Bristol. We were, you know, and Tony Wilson. Tony Wilson was really yeah. basically up on us before he was doing. I don't know anything. how he did it. He just completely picked up, and we played Manchester more than Bristol. Yeah, yeah. and there wasn't really a scene in Manchester that we kind of knew of, but you could see in the audience, like Rob Gretton brought Curtis along. Certain ratio was asking us for support gigs. Bands were forming. This was very early. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. we were the first post-punk band, because why were that to a certain extent? But we were actually playing while well, everybody else was still playing punk. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm not saying that deliberately. I'm just trying to correct some of this misinformation that's out there on the, the dark web about me. About it was a lot, yeah. <laughs> and my genitalia. Might be your own but fault. I think yeah. that <laughs> our New York thing also, the Patti Smith, television, Richard Hell, that brought in talking heads even. They yeah. brought in elements that were so different to the Ramones and kind of what the yeah. Pistols... Were you already, was that pre-Ramones you'd already found well, that? Yeah, I think with Patti Smith for certain. So and, the, and Little horse, Johnny Jewel. Yeah. Little yeah. Johnny Jewel was horses. very early on. Yeah, yeah, 75. Yeah. yeah. So that blew our heads. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm I didn't like the Ramones myself. The, well, they were, that, as, as you were saying, there was a point where yeah, they, were, yeah. they were like the sledgehammer. Whose but, interview is this? 
It's, it's mine. <laughs> well, you don't get it, do you? <laughs> I had Simon Reynolds in this thing in Berlin saying, in 1975, you did this, Mark. I was going, what? Well, that's kind of what you... There was no that's that's there my were no job. <laughs> there were no aggressive females before Harry Up. I mean, they, you know, there were mental female... There was in Blackpool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were going out to the clubs in Bristol very early on when yes. you were 12, 13 years old because yes. you're so tall you could get in. Yes. Well, I would have gone anyway. But I'm interested in that because it's the idea that's it's adding to what the music, your musical palette in a sense. Yes. The, the truth so is, what kind of clubs were you going to? I'll come back to you guys. No, I'm going to just say there oh, that unbelievably yeah. I was looked 11 when, we broke up. And you got when I was like seven yeah. and I, I get, get in. Oh, so what, it was nothing to do with him being tall. No, yeah. Mark got into clubs you had to be even you know, older too, but everybody could go to these soul and funk clubs yeah. that you were meant to be over 18 and we were going to them when we were 13 and 14. Oh, so, so you yeah. were going there and I wasn't going, whatever. I thought we might be covering each other. <laughs> no way. He's, he's even going Harris to... Harris was going to these... Uh, better in America, clubs. they dress up these little girls as what well, they like <laughs> carnival queens. His mum was dressing them up in these little outfits and there's a lot of handicraft. So Gareth was going to better... Like in Totnes. So he's making dream catchers. <laughs> and I was in there. These was, you can make silk out of vegetables. Even then, and we use a lot yeah. of we use a lot of bath soap, don't we, Matthew? <laughs> so what kind, what music were they playing in the clubs? Well, that, that you go basically to again, forth. yeah, we were getting into fifties clothes. Malcolm in Let It Rock, and Lloyd Johnson at Johnson Johnson's was selling these kind of like zoot suits and winkle pickers. And me and my much older mates who were these sort of dockers. These Italian, like the Joseph Fiatis. We were wearing like very sharp, 50, no offense, very sharp 50s clothes. <laughs> 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 Original stock, not like Boney Maroney stuff. But um, obviously a bit of case catalog because you get to that page in the shower where there's ladies' Brentford nylons. Don't go there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was more a fashion thing. So I walked into, so I was going to the clothes shops and I was interested in clothes. Mm -hmm. from Andy Mackay, really, in Roxy Music. And Jay was into Sha Na Na. There was, some, there was something going on in 73. There was like a Teddy Boy revival. The rock and Roll Revival. Yeah, wicked, yeah. wicked. Yeah. 12 years old. So I walked into this place the first night on my own. I mean, my uncles were sort of secure. My uncles were quite... They'd been go they, they, there was a guy called Johnny Carr and the Cadillacs, the first British rock and roll... The first Bristol rock and roll band that my uncles bounced for. The Teddy Boys used to have razors under their drapes. And when they used to try and throw them, they'd cut their hands up. Anyway... Walked into we could his try club, that. and there were these kids. Because I used to read Andy Warhol's, Andy Warhol's interview. I used to read about Little Nels and these places in New York and these weird artists, Basquet or whatever. And I dreamed that there was some club you had to press a doorbell to and you'd be taken up in a lift at a very early age. And I thought this was the place. I walked in there and all these kids were doing... I don't understand. They were doing these really weird kind of robot sort of monkey dancing. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, what the fuck is this? And it was two bands like Ultra Funk. There was this Eddie Harris track, the, the, the jazz saxophone. Funky as fuck. And the, mm -hmm. the just bass line stuff. And there was a single, The Avon Soul on me. It wasn't Soul. And it was a gang of lads and girls who'd get dressed up at the weekend and always go to this particular a week. Uh, and it became a gang. And they crossed football lines, county lines in Bristol, which were always a problem. Because before, anyway, you'd go, you'd just get a glass in your face. Yeah. Someone went out, even the youth club, somebody'd get their legs broken. You know, it's mental. Because of different accents around town? Or? Suede heads. Yeah, yeah. Gangs. Yeah, yeah. Um, not there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially in the music <laughs> business. Um, but um, I thought, I'm at home. Yeah. And then, so we were wearing all these clothes and we were wearing mohair jumpers. I must admit, some of us did wear plastic sandals and white socks. That was, plastic sandals is a good look then, <laughs> not the socks. I tried to make yeah. some flippers into a point. <laughs> and when we first wore this, went to the clash, I couldn't get any bondage trousers that fit, so I got some fireman's things from the army surplus like, and put some car seat belts around them. Anyway, there goes my career. Um, <laughs> what career, I hear you say. Um, yeah, and I thought this is this is the place for me. But then, so I was reading the enemy because I was interested in music as well. But everybody had long beards. King Arthur on ice. It was miles away, right? Yeah, yeah. Miles and miles away. You had to go to Charter House. You had no idea that you could possibly be a musician. Suddenly, I saw a little tiny picture this big of some kids in exactly the same pink stripy mohair jumper that I just bought up in King's Road. I didn't realise that somebody came up to me in the jukebox in, in, in McLaren's and said, can you sing? I didn't realise, well, you didn't know what was going on then. Chrissy Hines and a few other people did. Mm -hmm. It hadn't come out. 
And I thought they looked like us. And I, and I heard the stuff, and it sounded stepping stone away. But it, it sounded a bit sort of reneg, you know, re old fashioned. But at least you could go somewhere. And all my mates started going. And these people hadn't been into music. They were like kids who worked out in the, on the, in, in, on the production lines in the aerospace. You know, mm -hmm. they were guys who just worked to buy clothes for the weekend. So it gave our whole generation. It got us into music, and it gave us a. A tribal, anyway. That's yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Sorry. So, so were your mates going up to London with you? No. So it's just you. You, you were the ambassador from Bristol. Going For the to whole London. world, of people yeah. say in Germany. Yeah. And you, Los Reyes del Post Punk. So you were coming back from King's Road. I created Road. it all. I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody <laughs> believes me. I did. He doesn't believe you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so you were coming back from the King's Road in a pair of pink pegs, strung yeah. around. With the idea. Your Rucci top, walking around town, everybody looking at you, but yeah. I'm big enough that if they said anything. I'd kind of go like that, not in an aggressive way. You'd have to be act mental. Yeah. <laughs> when the first first time you saw him, what did you think? Well, we, well I didn't see him because he's in his beard. No, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't asking you, was I? Mike, sorry, we went to these two schools, oh, Mike, the, the Cortinas <laughs> and uh, the other guys from the pop group. So we, we, get, went, yeah. we went. I went to a school called Cotton. We went and to Bristol went Grammar, to the Grammar and School. The two schools. Yeah. yeah. The two sort of different <laughs> bands were made up of members from both schools. Yeah. So we would literally meet up at, you know, go to the same little cafes and have these chats about what was, you know, you were really excited about what was going on. So, Say you, you know, well, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was it. It was just pretty by osmosis. This weird thing. You keep hearing all the people you interview in Manchester, Edinburgh, Glasgow. Yeah. There's these mm -hmm. tiny little gangs of somehow some weird Nobody all picked knew. up on something, didn't they? they yeah, picked oh, yeah, that, yeah. But they're tiny little, they're such small amounts, like the people say about that the, uh, Manchester gig. You know, oh, the pistols, little, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. And it's the same everywhere. It was just a, such a small amount of people that somehow their antennae got twinged and, and they suddenly thought something's happening here that I can get involved with. And it's like Mark said, before that, you just had no idea. You just thought, you know, this is... This is the land of the giants. People like us don't go yeah, there, you know. <laughs> yeah, metaphorically, <laughs> yeah, physically. <laughs> yeah. They're, but what all was they're all tiny, most musicians, anyway, as you probably what, what know. What was brilliant about it was, it was undefined, wasn't it? What well, it was it, well that, was, that, yeah. that first thing, and I think that's the real... I don't know where we got it from, for, but straight away we got... Disillusioned isn't, isn't even the right word. We saw the sort of clash to that first album, then almost straight away they just turned into something really weird with that take get enough rope thing mm -hmm. and uh we just as we just really want i particularly just wanted to do something really different from by any means necessary mm -hmm. you know, we, this, we, and that's how we became new romantics no <laughs> <Well>, mark did <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole Honestly, other story <laughs> we could have been spandau or duran if it wasn't for his weird sax noises <laughs> i was ready i had the hair and everything he wanted to be a pop band he really I wanted am, to be the pop group <laughs> well that's the interesting thing isn't it because you were trying to be a pop group but he just came out a little wonky well yeah. sort Who says of wonky? <laughs> everybody well, some everybody, say wanky yeah. <laughs> listen but to gold no, blade it, look, just basically uh, desperate to bring in completely different colours, even if it was sort of impossible to do it. it the, that was the thing for me I got from punk was the attitude that like mm. you don't have to be able to sort of be a master of this thing. If you can get across somehow what you wanted, then, you know, <laughs> like his lyrics, yeah, you know. Yeah. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> Just try to ignore him. You, you spent a few no, years no, trying so, to do So that. I would do things like I'd wire up a violin and put it through a wow-wow pedal and mm. sort of just make a horrendous racket. But I just thought that's... I kind of thought that's what punk was. Yeah. Well, uh, in, in, in almost a deliberate way to, to avoid the trap, the trap of becoming a 12-bar rock and roll yes, band. Yeah, yes, It'd become yeah, a cliche yeah, already. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And your role in this was... Because you're not the musician, are you? But you, you but Hang on, John. You're not. Well, you don't play anything. He, he plays piano. Oh, and my you, God. Yeah. <laughs> But you're, but you're I will defend Mark there. I think he is a no, musician. No, no, that, that, that was actually... You don't want to be a fucking musician. I know, I was, I was celebrating the fact oh, that he was a artist. musician. Nigel Kennedy, yeah. <laughs> but that was one of the great things about that period, that the people who weren't musicians could make music. Toxic, That's what I say. Toxic Tampax shock. Are we going to stop talking about periods now? If you want to. Okay. Yeah. We st people still can. Stop putting a lid on it. When you were I saying, it, when you were saying it wasn't on defined, it, it yeah. was... And I'm not, it, I know you, you're not as bad as a lot of journalists. I'm not knocking journalists, but it is very easy to try and define something and put it in a genre or a box, right? 
And I don't want to be put in a box until I'm fucking dead, not d meaning to swear mm -hmm. in front of children. And the whole point, about, I think, about post-punk is, and I'm going to say, I've said it a couple of times before on Italian national television. Um, <laughs> Robert, Roger Moore said to me, acting is just moving one eyebrow. As Bowie told you about when Roger Moore kept on, he found out he lived in the same village in Switzerland, he kept on looking through the letterbox. I wasn't at the gig. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Where was I? Sorry, John. You were in Italy, but going back, it's about the spirit of post-punk. The spirit of freedom, the spirit of... Yes, uh, well, we, we didn't call it... You don't call it post-punk. No, because how could it be a post-punk? Because you were still Postman really punk, punk, in a sense. Postman punk. Yeah. Postman punk with a big... <laughs> um, so basically, punk, for, as far as... I, for me, personally, punk blew open the doors. Mm -hmm. And then when Mark was giving out his magazine, Perry was giving out his magazine at the Roxy with just a couple of chords, like in the Mersey Beat days... It demystified and brought down the instruments which the which the hippies had taken up to the hippie heaven. Mm -hmm. We were allowed to touch these golden harps for once, mm -hmm. right? And anybody could fucking do it. And the more naive you were, often the better. I mean, look at Eater, mm -hmm. Garris mates. Yeah. Um, or the Lurkers, your mates, obviously. Um, oh, no one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Um, and so we just thought, for us, punk, you know, like let's said, punk is an attitude. It's just like, what, what, why can't, if somebody tells you you can't do it, you want to do it. All these engineers, all these journalists were saying, you can't do that, you can't put the, you can't mix wheat gym with live yogurt. It's like, do you know what I mean? Mm. Somebody tells me not to do it. Yeah, yeah. I I've mean, got this saying, if somebody says you're being rebellious, you're too forward, you're in their face, good. Yeah, which is totally in the spirit of that moment wasn't it still that yeah. moment was not a moment yeah but the the germination of it where it started the the explosive moment it's a weak germ yeah yeah, yeah. The, well, it, well, it but was it an explosive moment for me there was there was when isabel Eberhardt went and wrote oblivion seekers that was an explosive moment when lotrim when people have but i'm not defining it there's a saying in bali that we have no art we do everything well to try and make out that an artist is more or less important than somebody else and only they have these explosive moments is fascistic. Mm. Mm. Of course. Yeah. I mean, how was you, you making sense of all this in, in the room <laughs> when you started making sense of him for the start? <laughs> you go in the room, first time to rehearse, and it's, it's a big idea. It's probably just belong. We're all just, sorry, we're all just completely full of energy and sort of, you know, it just all fed into it. And I don't really, you know, Mark was no different from the rest of us, really, and there's a sort of pure excitement about what we were doing, and we were able to do that, and then, you know, when we got on stage, obviously, we weren't that different from other things, but we were enough different that people went, fuck, what is this, you know, because mm -hmm. we had stopped playing the three chords. In fact, we were playing one chord yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in almost all the same songs, but uh, uh, but it was just the uh, initial, that thing that we had, because this sort of collective thing that all the great groups have, you know, you don't... You, they might be completely separate sort of people, but when they hit the stage or when they're out together, they've got a collective vibe or whatever, and, and we had that. Was, had it that. A, was it a moment when it kind of, it's not the right word, but kind of made sense, you know, like once the rhythm section goes solid? Well, I think we were too naive to even know that, to be honest. So you I just mean, felt that, your way through it instinctively? Well, it was just sort of things where we, I mean, there was a moment where we supported the Cortinas at the Marquee on the day Elvis Presley died, mm -hmm. and um, they all... <laughs> 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 and big supposedly moment. that yeah. you know we did our set and they were in the audience they went fuck it we can't play after that it's one of those moments mm. and they were our mates and they were really generous about it they, it, it was an, and then from then on we just you get that weird arrogance in a band where you just do it's just a crazy mm. stupid thing but you just think you're better than everybody else you know in a sort of collective uh, way and that spurs you on so I don't think I'm yeah. better than anybody else yeah, as a musical as genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm definitely not a musician then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to, you have to have a certain belief. Yes, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, make it's it work. Stupid naive arrogance. Yeah. I'm not going to sort of, you know, and it's so it's just like like sport. You know, somebody wins a game that day, somebody loses. It's that sort of comp you know competition. I mean, well, was there a point where you thought actually this we can actually make this thing work? You know, no, I, I got no idea about that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, so on the whole, I make everything not work. <laughs> and so, so everything was just pretty well. We do this gig, then that gig. Let's yeah, yeah, absolutely. In the, yeah. You know, it's just you know, in the moment sort of thing. I still feel like that. I just feel you've got to be in the moment, and yeah. there's never a sort of grand plan. Can I add to something Gareth has just said there? Yes. There's a saying, and I. I personally can't speak in the past tense about 
we were this or we were that or I was this because I, I feel more uh, engaged or enraged now than I ever have done mm -hmm. and sort of but I think it's 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 and I don't want to sound like I think it's every human's um, every human when they wake up in the morning should open their eyes because most people just spend half their lives going, if you just open your life and look around, you, you get that energy straight away. It's there. Mm, mm. It's there. It's like that. And that's, that's, what, that's there. And, and you notice it and you join into it and it's there. You know, people who walk around like this, pissed off, or, you know, what, fuck off. Yeah. yeah. It's like, cheer up. It's fucking there. And we got it, we had it, and about arrogance, and not saying arrogance in the sense of egotistical arrogance, because humility is very important, especially in the punk thing, because the people in the band, the people in the, in the audience were as important as the people on the stage, and the people on the stage were getting into the audience. You know, it's like really, it was just being there and mm -hmm. feeling. I remember going to Throbbing Gristle gigs and feeling, just meeting nice people in the audience and feeling I had somewhere to go after the Cubs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we had this saying, I like the Cubs, but we knocked down one of the walls playing well, uh, the Bulldogs, the Cubs and they then. banned me, they took all my badges off. Um, <laughs> Um, you can use these enemy interviews as therapy, can't you? That's what Cardi Minogue, that's what um, Taylor Swift does. Is it, you're using this for therapy? Is this enemy Is still? this working? I thought you worked for Sounds, it's, Gary Bushell. Yeah, Sounds is best paper. Yeah. Um, oh, the saying was, there's the arrogance of power, who people think they assume some power over people, which they don't have, if the people deny it. But we uh, punk rockers had the power of arrogance, of just like walking down the street saying, why not? Why can't we, you know? Mm. And that's half of the reason why we called the record Why, because I remember there was a, um, a poster, like one of those old Athena posters. Remember those things they used to sell in the back of the enemy with the loon pants of some soldier being shot in the Spanish yeah. Civil War or something? And it just, it just it said Why in the, in, with a question mark, like CND sort of anti-war movement stuff. Um, and there was a, a Rovers late night drinking club that I took Strummer to once. And, and it was run by the DJ at the Rovers. You know, halfway through the match when the mascots come on and have a little fight or do a little dance and there's a DJ between the... It was Keith, who was a Rovers DJ and he'd have a place on Park Street called Why Not? Yeah, yeah. So it evolved. I'm sounding like Patty Smith. It, it evolved. <laughs> from Why Not to Why. When Rovers changed their strip yeah. from that black and white, blue and white, nice yeah. old fashioned, you know, it evolved. Are you a gas head then? Is no, I can't. I couldn't go to football. I'd get, I'd get too into big. trouble. Well, yeah. people just well, they attack me all the time. I mean, nothing <laughs> much changes. <laughs> <laughs> Happened to talk key last night, but um, <laughs> see your rovers. It went. Um, it, it kind of. I flipped it in a fluxus kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You throw the I Ching into the chance procedure, as Brian mm -hmm. would say, and I just thought. And then a Y evolved. Which is a great name for the album, actually. Yeah. 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 And we're trying to find like old bits of tapes of we, we've got back our original reels and stuff and just going through going through archives and stuff. I thought about calling the the original mixes of the album X, but I thought that'd be a bit wank. I can see what you're trying to do. There. I know. <laughs> There's money in pretension. <laughs> I thought another master stroke was getting Dennis Pavel to uh, produce the album. Sorry. I mean, he wasn't the initial choice, oh, was initial he? Initial choice was John Cale. Cale. Didn't he fall? Yeah. Did, uh, uh, get, but he unfortunately got shot. Uh, yeah. King Tubby, John Cale came down to Bristol for a meeting, didn't he? Go? And yeah. he, did he fall asleep or something? He fell yeah. asleep, yes, in a sort of what we naively thought was jet lag, but I think it was more drug induced. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we did, we actually wanted John Cale and then with, with Dennis engineering, I mean, which would have been. Odd. Fantastic. Yeah, I think there would be a yeah, few yeah. arguments. Because John's there. work on Desert Shore and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think John mm -hmm. Cale's, I mean, he's done brilliant stuff, but I think yeah. Dennis Pavel was perfect. He was perfect. Yeah, yeah. But, and it was, you know, that thing, we, the, the one thing disappears, another one opens up. And, and Dennis was absolutely perfect, apart from he didn't turn up for the first four days. <laughs> <laughs> so he it was a chance <laughs> to learn the songs. <laughs> Because he was writing his number one hit, Silly Games. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is a great song. Well, he yeah. invented oh, Lover's Rock. Game. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it was a great song. <laughs> That's the wedding version. But uh, yeah. obviously when he turned up, we didn't really know that much about him personally, but you know quite a lot now. But he, you know, he, 
he had a lot of roots in this sort of white music that we didn't really realise. Big he, Jimi Hendrix fan. A massive Jimi Hendrix but fan, but, but you know, he'd stuff. been in bands yeah. Yeah. You know, with his mates doing cover versions of sort of 60s songs when he was really young. But, you know, he did a, you know, he's got the, one of those incredible inventive minds and had created sort of all his own sound systems and things mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. The sort of guy that knows, you know, I've got no idea how to tune a guitar virtually still, but he knows how to put it all together and all that stuff, so... You know, he was uh, he was amazing. So, yeah. what did he bring in there? I mean, I'm I'm guessing yeah. here, looking from the outside, he bring a sense of space in there, so it's not too cluttered, or is that already? Well, we'd already out? we'd actually done that. We yeah. went from this thing of having sort of pretty organised songs, and then I personally thought they were still too straight, and we somehow we went away to this rehearsal room, and that started completely de deconstructing <laughs> stuff. And that's yeah. where the magic for me happened. That's where why we sort of born, where we suddenly just. Somehow Mark started doing his singing over these long, weird, you know, much weirder things than just normal songs. Mm -hmm. And then Dennis put that together and brought the sort of X factor by then also introducing dub. So, so in, in a way, you'd almost accidentally started to write proper songs. So you had to stop doing that. Was yeah. that a discipline? Yeah, 100%. So is it, is it, would you say it's a discipline record? Well, basically the pop group... Yes. My concept of the pop group, before I tried to f make a band called The Wild Boys, which was going to be on this youth club where we were going to come out mm. of dustbins and bin lags and bags in 73. And I kept you on still do it. I kept yeah. on practicing my signature on school books. Did you ever do that? Of course. Still practicing to this day, but nobody ever asked for it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've signed ladies' breasts in America. So you are quite rock and roll. And then they get a tattoo. Yeah. Remember that girl came up with it? Anyway. Only your breasts, Gareth. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So my idea was, because I think, because we had this song called Hypnotism by the Radio and a song called You Love Objects. These songs, we can't even find them anymore. They've got to be, Edwin Collins has got them in his loft or something. These very early tapes. Um, and we were basically, I, my idea was to write like Chicory Tips. I went to see Gorgia Moroda the other day and that Son of Your Father, Son mm -hmm. of the Chicory Tips song. Mm -hmm. If you could write something like that with... I don't use, like to call, use the word message, but with disruptive lyrics, then mm -hmm. the, we, we, I'm not trying to be existential and outside. We, we, we wanted to be a pop group mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And I think we are a pop group, mm -hmm. right? But I think you're allowed to do whatever you want inside that thing, mm -hmm. right? And at one stage, we were on the front cover of every music in the same week where we were still at school, every music, blah, 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 blah. But because of... Out forces outside of our control, i.e. censorship and, and corporate policy, and this digital dictatorship we live in now, they, they don't like disruptive elements, right? But now they're finding out through platforms and whatever that it is the essence of how to make billions of pounds. So a lot of the ideas we were being playing with have been co-opted by the the utopians from Silicon Valley, Valley which mm -hmm. is, anyway. But now we're slaves to the algorithms. Basically, our whole idea of democracy, which is now a digital dictatorship, because of, the, we're, because of our lust for convenience, our rights have been usurped, even the idea of the nation state. So there you go. Mm. And you see what you do is the little fly in the ointment there still? Or? I've never thought of us ever as them and us. I've never been, you know, people keep on saying, people for some reason think I'm some sort of sep sep separate, a lesbian separatist, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at the thing as an idea of, I was watching this thing about Greek theatre and politics, the polis is everybody. Mm -hmm. If you look at the thing as a whole, and I remember when one of my mates in, back in the day were becoming far-right skinheads or football hooligans or something, they were still my mates. Mm. The more you push people away, and then they realised they wanted to come to reggae gigs because there, no, there were no girls at screwdriver gigs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm quite kind of... I, I, I don't know the words to use in these sort of things, but I'm, I'm quite <laughs> inclusive in the thing, and I don't, I don't really want to be somebody that stands on the corner and tuts about things that have already happened. I think if your minds are open <laughs> enough, especially like seeding future generations, if people throw a, a huge curveball into the future, not knowing what's going to happen, then we can create the future instead of touching about what's already happened, which mm -hmm. we can't fucking change. And does that bring us back to the album? 
Come on, we need to... I, I should be at Schumacher College, you know, deep rack shop. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Burn your bras. Moobs, rather. <laughs> so what was why that then? Was that... Still is. Something that's thrown into the future... Totally, and it's so weird. It it's so weird, because yeah. I don't feel... You know, he, when we're going through these tapes, we found some songs that nobody had ever hear, heard. For me, lyrically, it's like so, uh, somebody posted a letter into one of those spacecraft or something, and you get it back. Mm -hmm. So I'm... I mean, I talk to myself, I try, that's why I go out, I try to stop it, but you're getting a message of stuff I hadn't even really thought about properly, and I, you know, I knew more then than I do now. Mm. John, can I ask you a question? Do you, have you got any reason why why has been so sort of missed? In, what, in the, oh, I think it's, it's, it's treasures, isn't it? Do you mean... Well, uh, I'm just asking not to, you. You mean not to level out a Joy Division record? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe, maybe even Mark, like Mark said, why are all these sort of people... Is it because it's just too difficult? No, I don't think it's a difficult record. Good. And also, you can you can hear the influence yeah. in quite a lot of places. I mean, obviously, when the birthday party turned up, it's like, yeah, Jesus, yeah. that's... Yeah. You know, we'd all heard that yeah, before yeah, somewhere, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think um, may, maybe because the labels you're on were so erratic. You didn't have right. a Tony Wilson yeah. t explaining the story uh -huh. in media terms. It's, that's how it works right. in music, isn't it? It's right. not yeah, always... Yeah, I'm just interested to hear But the one thing is, that record doesn't sound dated no, at all, does it? Yeah. It's, and when, it's, it's in the future. And it still yeah. has a, an energy on it, and, and the production is so fantastic. I mean, I know that's quite boring, but it's actually... Well, I think it's, he did an amazing it's, job it's, of at it. At the end of the yeah. day, that's what you're going to listen to, isn't And it? it wasn't cluttered. Like, a lot of people's music was cluttered then, but you had the space and the sounds, yeah. Yeah. and the energy, and mm -hmm. the kind of... Uh, the, and the madness as well, yeah. which is important. Yeah. But what, why do you think it's? Do you, do you feel, I'm do you feel that? A professional. I don't go <laughs> I wish it was a professional. <laughs> but but why, why do you do you feel that's what happened? Do you think? 100%, feel like I said. I feel we completely went under the radar, and you have to sort of kind of go. Well, what what happened to us? You, you know. You would, uh, but it's, you're halfway. I don't well, think. Well, I'm interested. I, I I don't know. You didn't you know? get the 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 Joy Division. I'm, I'm thing. pleased we didn't because I think this where we're at now will be much more exciting, much more interesting in a way than if it had happened when... But you didn't end up like Glaxo Babies, you know, another local oh, band. Oh, oh, no. But you'd have to know about music to know about them. But right, most yeah, people yeah. know about uh, so-called underground music would know the pop group. Right, so you okay. do exist on the map. Okay. You didn't fall off the know. map. You're just somewhere in the middle, <laughs> which is a bit irritating, isn't it? Well, well, Not, I, just I see it in a different way because I think, I think you're seeing it through a prism of this wanky Derrida reading fucking English music press. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, again, not to blow which, my which own you'd trumpet. Probably, you'd, you'd probably read for a long time. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who's laughing at me? There's Everyone. There. There's, loads of, there's loads of them. Everyone. Come you're on out, then. You might be seven oh, foot tall, you know. but you're outnumbered this time. Oh. <laughs> Revenge is sweet. Um, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but... Um, quite soon after the pop group, I started doing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. and I started traveling quite intensively, right? And around the world, that record has had a hell of an impact, right? And like you're saying, especially with fellow musicians or whatever, mm -hmm. but with, mm -hmm. again, there's, I mean, like we, I I'm not knocking journalists, but it's like, they, they, it's, it's like, they help, they help you to a certain extent in England, but in England, it's like you've got to have something new. It's happening more with the internet here. You've got to have something new, new flesh for the gladiator, new flesh to feed the monster every week. And there's this turnaround of, like, new shininess or whatever. But, and that's one of the reasons, I mean, I was living in Berlin. That's one of the reasons I wanted to, that I thought it'd be cool to, the guy who um, wrote and invented The Simpsons, Matt Groening, was curating All Tomorrow's Parties, and he wanted... Well, he asked us to reform the pop group, and he wanted Iggy to reform the Stooges as as his as his key mm -hmm. influential things, right? So just knowing that people like Mike Watts and Matt Groening in some little town in the states found this thing and it blew their minds mm. keeps you going, and it it you know and across the world they, and again internationally, I find there's incredibly open-minded and educationally to me totally inspirational people across the bloody world. Mm -hmm. In England, you tend to get stuck in your own pub. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And become a bit depressive because it's just wrong. So, and, you know, and I, I was really pleased and I'm, I'm, you know, and we're really involving every, every member and even the old managers and stuff from that thing. Everybody should, should have the kudos because it was a, it was a band, it was a band, it was created by like eight or nine people, really. Mm -hmm. 
people around us and stuff, you know. And those people should get, like John and everybody, and Simon and everybody, should get as much kudos as, as the people who are the public face today. I'm actually really surprised to hear that you think it's an ignored well, that record. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think about it much, but you do know, you, you do, you know. I mean, it's, it's definitely considered one of the 20 key records at that point in time. I mean, you just wanted to be the one. In <laughs> that point in time. Well, it is a period of time. You can't get away from that. You can, you can theorise Nick that. Cave chose us as one of the music of the millennium. And Daddy G, excuse me. I've got to well, sell my own record. There you go. Well, you better, you better tell him. Yeah. Because it, because it is considered one oh, of the, no, the Keystone yeah, records at that it's, point. It's, it's, we wouldn't be here yeah. in Totnes yeah. otherwise. Yeah, so I mean... It's, I've so, got to go and open a now. supermarket after this with Christopher Biggins. <laughs> You're not joking either. No. no. <laughs> He's a high intellect, John, honestly. <laughs> he is. On thimbles. You know him. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, I know everybody. Freddie Stark. Of course, look. That's, that's an interesting kind of pairing. Some of us moved straight into the media. When you were, you know, after the Roxy, we went to the colony rooms with Francis Bacon, but I went straight to Larry Grayson. <laughs> I know where my heart is, you know. I love it. I'd like to dedicate this interview to Freddie Starr, who I think invented punk rock. Seeing Freddie Starr when I was like six or seven years old was showed me how to be a man. It showed you how to do an interview. Total role model. Yeah. Well, that doesn't. Stan so Boardman on the Desert Connor talking about the Fokker Wolves. He's, still, <laughs> he's still doing it. My mum <laughs> nearly wet herself. And then I popped out. <laughs> she said she pulled me out by my. She, well, that doesn't nothing. surprise me. <laughs> mum! <laughs> Sorry, the manager's pulling a really awful face. Maybe this explains why your record's not taken as serious as it should be. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> Comedy's a new rock and roll, isn't it? Where's well, Stuart, where's Stuart Lee? <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a bad moment, wasn't it? Well, <laughs> which moment was that? Comedy, the new oh yeah, 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 yeah. But then you weren't rock and roll, were you? Or, or were you rock and roll as it should have been because it went exactly. off exactly? Yeah, it was very fair. Rock and roll, early rock and roll, early feral kind of appellation. Mm. Yeah, totally. Mm. Still are. I don't like this past tense. It's like you know, it's like talking at your own bloody funeral. Mm. Well, well, it is in a way, isn't it? Where, is it? Where, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Last rights by John. <laughs> every, time, every, every time somebody dies, you think there might be room on the throne. <laughs> wait till the end for the acclaim. Wait for them all to die off. <laughs> Your funeral, my trial. Nick Cave again. Yeah. Tied to circus. I mean, in a way. Do you know Nick Cave's real second name? Like Engelbert's? You've got to make this up, but tell us. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he told me. He whispered in my ear. Ebree. No, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> go on, go the on. the mem. It's going to go viral. Well, you're just making it up anyway. No. Yes, you are. I'm being postmodern. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so in the way that record, in the past, but it was it was a punk rock record, or that's what a punk rock record should have sounded like, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think punk is a pretty of a crap word, actually. So nobody it, wanted it, to call it punk at yes, the time, yes, either, yes, did yeah, they? Yes, but yes, if we so have to use that word, yeah, 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 I think it is. I think it's you know throw throw everything that you're excited about into the pot and see what comes out. And if everybody did that, we'd have, you know, the only other people that maybe did that a wee bit was alternative TV, hey, you know, mm. and, and that was it. It was a simple formula, really. It was, it was just something you really heartfelt about. If you can express that, then it comes out. People can hear it. They can hear it. They really can hear it. And don't censor you know? yourself. Yeah. Throw Do in the craziest juxtaposition, like we're saying, like, you know, bag puss with, with water Carlos, you know, just crazy shit. And mm. that's where you get the, the curve. The bricolage culture. The cut and paste of punk magic. rock. If you do yeah. chaos magic rituals, a huge ball of stuff appears. Mm. Which was that record? Pardon? Was that was the record well, that you a could huge say, ball of stuff? You could say the chaos. Ball of stuff. <laughs> you could say chaos is the still point of nature. Mm. So when when everything's whirling round, that you know, you catch that point where it's the centre of all the chaos. And I kinda think we kinda caught that a lot with why. Yeah. There's a chaos, but it's, it's anchored. Yes, it? that's, yeah, that's yeah, the thing, yeah, that's what it? I mean. It's a still yeah. point. Yeah. You know? I know I've said this before, but the, the, because the rhythm section is holding it down. Yeah, vivi yeah, section is holding it down. We'll hold you down a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I'm anti vivi section. 
but they, but everything was going off on top of it, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's still the the, the rhythm section is pretty loose. It's not, you know, it's not. That's the thing. You've got your people. Other bands had very mm. basically simple beats that they did the stuff on top. Our rhythm section is kind of all over the place, to be honest. In fact, there's only there's about four tracks with no rhythm section at all on Why, mm. so mm. which I think again makes it really interesting. Mm. Uh, broke the formula straight away there. W was that deliberate as well? Just I, to well, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. It was yeah. just you're not going to have a, every track's got you know a beat. You know, I think second, tr third tracks just piano, me and Mark, and, and it just goes off like that. So, mm. but I didn't understand why other people weren't doing that. <laughs> yeah, we that, just that, say, we that, just yeah. say take everything out. Uh, you hear something, drop down to piano. I did this thing with Wobble the other night, right? I just said everybody stop, and you go. The bass is just on its own. It's a, it's a dub technique. Mm, mm. Pull like everything back out of the board, you know. I mean, I mean, Dub was so keen that period, wasn't it? So okay. Anybody who's listening, Dub was so important, wasn't it? Dub? Not because of the effects, but the idea of space, Well, wasn't it? even more, sufferation. The lyrics, the yearning of, this, of the, of the suff sufferation mm. lyrics. Mm -hmm. Leroy Smart, Leroy Hubbles, uh, Hibbles. It meant I sang along more. I mean, in fact, Beyond Good and Evil is from some reggae tune, you know. I sang along more to the reggae tunes, right, for, for emotion. I mean, recently I've been really, the Turkish, Turkish, Turkish like Des O'Connor blokes really virtually start crying. If you see Turkish TV in, in Germany, they virtually start, they really emote. But back then, um, I can't rear off onto Turkey. You back then, it, yeah, yeah. I'd be singing along. I, I put a little speaker in a, in a little tin rubbish thing to get it to crackle a bit. Right, I'd be singing along. I'd used to wait for the band from Zion to arrive at Revolver Records on a Friday afternoon when they listened, used to listen through to the Seven Inches. Years later, I found it was Adrian Sherwood who was driving the van as a delivery man. I used to just sing along to these classic tunes. Not that I did learn to sing, but that's what got me like yodeling, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'd just use that and try and squeeze in some of my words that I got from wherever, weird like fanzines or whatever, weird stuff I was reading at the time, trying to squeeze in these things and flip them. And but then, on the B-side, on the dub, you'd suddenly get, my little girl was born at town, 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 town. So you could, you know, now I've got this karaoke machine where you can just press the button, I can do it at home, so I don't need to come out. But that yeah. is like <laughs> Alvin Stardust. For yeah. me, Skenger. Skenger, 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 Skenger. When it's slow down, Skenger, 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 Skenger. That sort of effect, which I was yeah. doing at five years old, me, fire, fire engine noises and getting eyes or toilet paper from school with a kind of <laughs> It's all done with my mouth. Dennis Bravo is a figment of your imagination. <laughs> yeah. So, that is really important. But I got more feeling and a little tingle down my back from hearing about these mm. lads who I later mm. got to mix, meet or go to the blues and see my black mates suddenly like really go into some mystical revelation to a bloody record. You didn't see that at Trapeze. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? I got, I got energy from that, from sufferation. And I found, you know, and that for me is political on a personal level. So, and, that, and, and then when you used to go and see The Clash, Don would be playing reggae before, whatever, we'd be listening to it in the thing. But in Bristol, we were into reggae before punk. Mm. Yeah, but that's... Into the, reggae, the, the reggae know? was massive, thing. absolutely massive. You know, in our band, everybody absolutely loved things like, mm. you know, our big youth and all that stuff. So it was, and like Mark said, that ha ha massive, the melodies, the mm. melodies, are, you know, they're Amazing. probably more where our sort yeah. of melodies come from than, yeah. than Beatles songs or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then squeezing in the free jazz because we were voracious consumers of, I call it information. Mm -hmm. Getting some bus fare from your mum going to school walking miles to school to save the couple of shillings or whatever, and there would be like these second-hand bookshops, record shops, sort of run by old sort of beardy guys on the way back home, all the time in there, just picking up like Leroy Jones because the cover looked cool or something. People do it with mm. why because of the Papua New Guinea mug. Picking up something that you... I've got this thing that taste is a form of personal censorship. Buy something you wouldn't buy, then you break out of your mould mm -hmm. in car boots or whatever, right? So we get amassing all this stuff, showing each other Michael McClure poems, right? A friend of mine in Gareth, Michael... Um, Mark Springer started playing piano. So we were getting into like, to start off, it'd be like Keith Jarrett and ECM when you're about 11. But then suddenly we found, 
I don't know what the route into Albert Ayla was, but probably Coltrane or something. Suddenly we found Albert Ayla and we were taking it like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were showing each other Muddy Waters. We were showing each other these ESP records, Pills Before Swat. Tom Rapp blew mm. my mind, this poet on this free jazz shit, right? Alan Ginsberg was coming to Bristol and doing poetry recycles, right? 74, 75, I was going up and talking to him. He's going, you're, re you're exaggerating the apocalypse. Having conversations with weird people like that, being in a taxi with Burroughs when he was doing the final academy, just, you know, I, God knows what Dr. Feelgood thought when they were like 11-year-old boys sat in their dressing room and they would, Lee Brillo was sweating like, we just go and follow people around, you know, and try and talk to them, and try and talk. Like, out now, I was coming in, I was chatting, I, he's in here somewhere, just there he is, chatting to him, chatting to some bloke, on, exactly, the, I'm the same. Yeah. Totally. Just... Anything's uh, better than chatting to your mum. <laughs> <laughs> just, just pulling in information. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, and spewing it back out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, finally, I think we're getting to the end because oh, I haven't no. got a clue what the time is. But um, tonight, what, what are you doing in here? Is it's it was in here. Yes, it's in here. There's, there's a lot of space for you. I think it's been cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really in the mood now. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> I know. Maybe in another forty years' time. No, I've got. I, I've. I've been trying to find a nail, a nail, a nail bar in uh, Totnes, and I, I need to get that back down. To, I need so to. I need to go to a pound shop. Well, so there's so no Primark. What are you doing tonight, then, Gary? Who's he's he's this nail bar. Bar. Waiting for him to go to the nail bar. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you will, you will be pleasantly surprised because basically, as we were talking about why, mm -hmm. right? When the phone call came from Paul Smith, who's like throbbing gristles, from a very cool friend of mine saying, would you, what do you think about doing the pop group for this, for this uh, Simpson blokes do? Mm -hmm. And again, I flipped it and I just thought, you know, we all start, we will, we, basically it's a gang of mates. If we hadn't have been in bands, if we'd been carpet fitters, we'd bounce into each other at somebody's funeral. It's all funerals in Bristol now, or, or mm -hmm. football match or, you know. You turn up with, I'd probably turn up with Gareth's daughter, you know, it's like that kind of incestuous kind of little estate. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I'm going a bit off piece now. Yeah, yeah. But we'd know each other anyway, right? The we good news is I haven't got a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what if your sons? <laughs> <laughs> it's a Bristol thing. Um, so, you know, there's, there, there, for me, there was a gang of about 200 of us, boys, girls. In Bristol, you don't see, you know, all different sorts of people, and we're all still mates. Mm -hmm. So getting the process going again, the first thing Bruce said, first thing I said, first thing Simon said, first thing Gareth said, if we get, we're gonna, we've got to do something new and come at, come at it with our attitude now, mm -hmm. whether it's different, better, worse, or whatever. You don't want to be a heritage act, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I've got a list of heritage of people who sold out. I could call out now. <laughs> um, so that's what the you devil did. will the devil will take them. <laughs> okay, so that's what they're doing tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's a black mass. It's an exorcism. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Thanks to Gareth. Thank you, John. Thanks to Mark. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks, thanks for thank coming. You